texts. And even as he's saying these things, it says, many believed in him. But is this really a true believing? So now Jesus gets into a new dialogue with these people who are claiming that they believe in him. Okay, so um, maybe we can look at verses 31 to 38. Uh, yeah, someone could read out for us 31 to 38. Verse 31. Then Jesus said to those, those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will, ma made free? You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my work has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. All right. So it says that many believed in him, even as Jesus spoke these things. But Jesus is not very convinced about their believing. Because, you know, we saw this earlier in chapter 6, um, John 6, 66. It said over there in John 6, 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So there are people who claim that they believe, but then later, you know, their actions show that they never actually truly believed. And uh, so Jesus now begins to address these people who are claiming that they believe in him. And he says, you know what an actual believer would do? He would hold to my teaching. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then, only then, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So, you know, this, uh, these are words which are spoken, uh, the sentences, uh, this phrase is spoke, spoken so lightly by everyone. But it becomes a reality for whom? Only those people who hold to his teaching. Such people alone are really his disciples. Only such people will actually know the truth. And the truth will be able to set them free. So um, when Jesus says over here, those who hold to my teaching, he's not talking about people who just simply know the truth intellectually. He's talking about people who believe to such an extent that they are actually upon what they believe in. Their actions show that they really believe that they are trusting him that much, that they are submitting to him that much. So holding to his teaching involves not just a intellectual belief, but also real obedience and submission. People who are holding to his teaching in that manner, they are the ones who will know the truth. They will know it deep in their spirit. It won't just be in their mind. They will know it as a certainty in their spirit. And because they know it in such a um, deep manner, then, only then, the truth will be able to set them free. So it's just simply a lighthearted knowing doesn't automatically set anyone free. If you were to ask Satan to write down an essay on the truth, he would be able to write the most excellent essay because he knows it all. But his knowing is a very intellectual knowing. He knows about it all. So he can you know, write an essay on the truth. He would get 200 out of 100, you know. But it is not a deep knowing, the kind of knowing which is talked about over here, because he has never actually held on to the teaching of Jesus Christ. Because true holding on to the teaching involves not just believing, but it involves, um, you know, obedience. It involves submission. It involves that kind of a practical believing. Such people know the truth in a completely different way. 
um maybe we can actually look at romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 which actually bring out this concept romans 12 1 and 2 if someone could read out i will see you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your responsible this reasonable service and do you not and do not be conformed to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god so here in romans 12 1 and 2 you look at how these people are being instructed to hold on to jesus teaching they are being asked to literally be a living sacrifice to to give up whatever god is asking them to give up okay so they are they are holding on to his teaching in that way such people something happens to their mind their mind gets renewed and that leads to a transformation they are no longer like the world they know they're transformed and they become a different category of people such people they are able to test and approve what god's will is because now with their renewed mind they are able to see everything from a new perspective and they begin to act you know in line with that new perspective and they begin to discover how pleasing and perfect god's will is so it's a there's a process which has taken place over there they started off by holding on to his teachings they began to uh, hold on to his teaching to a level where they were willing to submit and obey and sacrifice whatever was required as they began to do that it led to a renewing of their mind their mind began to get synchronized with god's mind they began to think the way he thinks they began to see everything the way he sees it and that led to a transformation where they were no longer conformed to the world where they were completely a different type of people altogether and these people such people they start to test his word start acting on it living it out and they begin to discover my goodness living this way really leads to a blessed life and they were able to discover how pleasing and good his will is so they don't really know the truth anymore at just an intellectual level they know it in a completely different way at a deep at a deeper level knowing the truth in that manner will set you free from every bondage because the truth has now become come alive inside your spirit it's 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 living itself out in you the living word of god is now living itself out inside you and that just breaks down every you know um every every stronghold there is you know there is still there so it all begins with something very simple where you are not like these people who followed jesus you know for a few days and then when the teaching got hard you know they said oh this is a hard teaching to accept and they walked away so such people the truth cannot set them free because they don't really know the truth yet they only still know it at the mind level so as a person starts holding on to his teaching you know that word holding on it talks about you literally hanging on holding on even when things get tough you know you have a strong wind blowing and you still hold on you don't get swept away so in that way when the storms of life hit when temptation hits when trials come along uh, when people are you know pressurizing you into compromising you hold on to the teaching and you submit and you sacrifice and you trust and you believe as you start doing that you begin to know the truth with a renewed mind you begin to see the truth of god's word in the way he sees it and this great power it starts becoming a living reality to you so now you no longer just simply know about it now you literally know it experientially deep in your spirit and then once you know the truth in that way what can stand in between 
nothing can come in, in between every uh, thing that tries to come in between will be broken and you will be literally set free so what kind of a freedom is jesus talking about over here you know he talks about that in the next few verses they would be set free from sin and they would also be set free from the consequences of sin so the truth will set you free in two ways first it sets you free from sin the control you know of sin over you it sets you free from sin and then once you start becoming free from the hold and control of sin you automatically being st start being set free from the consequences of sin as well you know because we and our families because of our sinfulness and our wrong decisions and you know maybe our uh, you know double mindedness we are caught up in so many uh, kinds of messes you know financial struggles um hurt broken relationships um um you know, uh, health problems, all of these things, they are a consequence of our sins. So when you really know the truth at this deeper level, it sets you free from the sin and you also be, be start getting set free from the consequences of sin. Um, yesterday, actually, in the church service, uh, you know, at our uh, APC Central location, uh, one of the worship songs was uh, the song by you know Darlene Shek, the one uh, the one which is called Victor's Crown, and there's this um, chorus which is repeated again and again. You know, it says every high thing must come down, every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the Victor's crown. You have overcome. You have overcome. Um, I mean, earlier, you know, um, earlier. When songs like this would be sung in the church, I would stand there feeling so helpless because I know that what is being sung is a reality, but I don't see that in my life and I don't see that in my home because in my home, there are still high things which, which are against God, you know, which are still there high and they're not being brought down. And in my own life, I can see strongholds which should come down, but they are not coming down. And I would think, yes, Lord, you are the you are wearing the victor's crown. You have overcome, but I'm not able to participate in that victory. What is wrong? Why am I not enjoying in this victory which you have won for us? And I would just stand there feeling so helpless. And somewhere along the way, I had to learn that it all starts with becoming a living sacrifice where you take a stand and say i will hold on to this teaching of jesus i will submit to him i will surrender to him i will believe and trust and obey no matter what it costs you start becoming a living sacrifice as you start becoming a living sacrifice your mind goes through a renewal process you start getting transformed and then those truths are no longer just truths, you know, the, about how the how he's wearing the victor's crown, about how um, he has defeated and um, and spoiled the principalities and powers, and you know, triumphed over them publicly. All those things are so real, and you start realizing that he has done all that for you and your family. Now you no longer know those things at an intellectual level. Now you literally know that in your spirit. And once you know it in your spirit that this is really true, nothing can stand because you will declare God's word and say, I believe this and this is what Jesus did for me. And so in the name of Jesus, you know, may this be broken. And you will begin to see it broken because now you literally know the truth in, at the spirit level and the truth shall set you free. So you're set free from, the con from, the, from sin itself, the hold of sin over your life. And you'll also be set free from the consequences of sin. So yesterday when that song was being sung, you know, I just I was just smiling to myself and said, Lord, how far you have brought me. Once upon a time, these words were all just words. But now because of your mercy and grace in my life, I have now begun to understand the truth of these words. And I'm actually be able to now enjoy a little bit at least of the truth of these words, you know, in my situations. So um, 
here jesus is trying to tell these people you know you people say that you're believing in me but you are still slaves of sin verse 34 he says very truly i tell you everyone who sins is a slave to sin now a slave has no permanent place in the family belongs to it forever so if the sun sets you free you will be free indeed you need to come to me believe in me hold on to my teaching believe in that way you know where you are literally willing to submit and obey if you do that i will set you free and then you will be free indeed nothing will be able to hold you down you will overcome you will have success and victory so he's trying to get this very important truth across to them and they say oh we are children of abraham you know we've never been slaves they're not getting what he is saying they're not understanding that his belief in him is fundamental to their entire life if they don't believe in his divinity and submit to him and accept his messiahship none of the other things are going to happen it doesn't make a difference whether they are children of abraham or not they are not children of faith the way abraham was a child of faith so it will not help them so in verse 39 jesus says if you were abraham's children then you would do what abraham did what did abraham do in genesis chapter 18 when messengers from heaven you know three messengers from heaven come to his tent he invites them he you know he 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 sets a meal in front of them and when they say your very old 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 wife yes will have a baby he believes it he believes the messengers which who were sent from heaven and now not just a messenger from heaven the very son of god has come down to these people and they're not believing in what he's saying so he you know he says to them if you really were abraham's children you would believe the way abraham believed here I am, literally come from the Father, and you are not believing what I am conveying to you. You know, so he is very frustrated with their unbelief. And then they say, we are not illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself. You know, so um, again, they are, you know, mocking Jesus and saying, you, we know about how you were born. You are illegitimate. On the other hand, we know who our father is. Our father is Abraham and our father is the one who is in heaven. Uh, the only father we have is God himself. So they, they're making all these claims, but their conduct, their choices seems to show that they are not really of God. So then, you know, Jesus, in fact, very frankly says to them, you are of your father, the devil. So it actually comes down to that, where he actually has to openly say that to them before it gets into their heads, you know, that they are not behaving at all like children of Abraham. They're in fact behaving like their father, the devil. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, d d dialogue uh, regarding that. And then finally, in, in the end, um, maybe we can maybe we can just look at some of those verses, I mean, because there's a lot over here um we will not have the time to get into all of it um maybe we can look at uh, verses 48 onwards mm. Forty eight. uh if you could read up to 55 yeah, if someone could read out for us, uh, chapter 8, uh, 48 to 55. Then the Jews answer and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges most assuredly i say to you if anyone keeps my word he shall never see that then the jews and say to him now we know that you have a demon abraham is dead and the prophets and you say if anyone keeps my word he shall never test that are you greater than the father abraham who is dead and the prophet 
prophets are they who do you make yourself out to be jesus answered if i honor myself my honor is nothing it is my father who honor me of whom you say that he is your god yet you have not known him but i know him and if i say i do not know him i shall be a liar like you but i do know him and keep his word yeah so uh, the the conversation gets really ugly around the you know latter part of chapter 8 uh, so um, if you were to look at the earlier verses um, yeah maybe verse 44 over there um, you are from your father the devil and you choose to do your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him when he lies he speaks according to his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies but because i tell the truth you do not believe me so you know uh, all the lies which uh, which your father the devil has been telling you you're so you know um, um, ready to believe in that but when i come to you and speak the truth to you you refuse to believe it okay so these people who claimed that they are believing in him he is now exposing them and he is saying that uh, your actions don't seem to indicate that you really believe in me uh, you know so he is uh, accusing them so from there the uh, you know because he you know he accused them and said that they are of the devil therefore now this is how they retaliate in verse 48 they say are we not right in saying that you are a samaritan and have a demon they most definitely know that he is not a samaritan i mean he was born into a jewish family so they know that so they just basically you know are very very angry and they are calling him a samaritan because that's the worst curse word which they can think of and they are also saying that he is demon possessed so uh, jesus says i do not have a demon but i honor my father and you dishonor me so you know he is in fact saying i am not demon possessed i'm actually the heavenly father possessed you know so um, that is the way jesus is combating what they are saying and so he says because i have come you know with the father's authorization i have come to honor him he says in verse 50 yet i do not seek my own glory there is one who seeks it uh, and he is the judge very truly i tell you whoever keeps my word will never see death uh, so the one who has sent me he is the one who has authorized me to be teaching you these things so therefore if you believe in him you will not even see death and that is when we come to the last portion of the dialogue so when he says that you will never even see death then the jews say ah even our father abraham even he also died he also saw death so how can you say that people who believe in you how uh, how can you say that they will not even taste death are you greater than our father abraham who died is what they say so then uh, this is what jesus says to uh, them in verse 56 he says your ancestor abraham rejoiced that he would see my day he saw it and was glad okay so that's basically how the the entire uh, thread of conversation comes down to the stage where they are now talking about abraham so uh, they say that even abraham also tasted death how can you say that you know a person who believes in you will not taste death how can that be is what uh, uh, they accuse and uh, so in response jesus says your father your ancestor abraham was in fact so happy when he was told about me so maybe i mean we don't really know maybe during some conversation between yahweh and uh, uh, abraham uh, god would have revealed to him about the future events about how one day the messiah will come so maybe these things were revealed to abraham and jesus says when you when abraham got to know about it about my day he saw it and he was glad so if you really were children of abraham you would experience the same joy you would be equally happy that you are seeing my day but you know instead of being happy in fact you are accusing me of being demon possessed and what not so so they say 
you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham, is it? You, you saw Abraham rejoicing, is it? How can that be? Because you know, you're not even 50 years old. And then Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, you know, the, that phrase which he always uses, which basically means, you know, it's highlighted, written in bold, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. So again, he uses that divine term, I am, to talk about his divinity. So these people who actually started off saying that they believe in him, now they pick up stones to stone him because, you know, he... So they are willing to accept some of his words. They are willing to believe in some of the things which he is saying, but they are not willing to submit to his divinity. They're not willing to uh, say, Yes, he is from the Father, and so we accept him as the Messiah, and we will do whatever he, say, he says. They are not willing to come to that level of trust and submission. So the great thing is that we, who are living uh, so many centuries later, who have not even seen Jesus physically, we are willing to trust him. We are willing to you know, uh, testify to him in our offices, you know, be criticized and mocked. So we really are blessed. So what they failed to do, we just by reading the scriptures are willing to believe in what is in what is recorded over here. So therefore, there is a great blessing upon us because we are willing to trust the Lord in this manner, just through the written word. We have not seen the things which they saw in their times. They literally saw Jesus standing over there doing the miracles. We, we didn't get to see that with our physical eyes. But we have trusted in what is recorded in these scriptures. And we are placing our faith in him. So actually, there is a blessing resting upon us because of the childlike faith which we have been willing to place in him. So therefore, because you know we are such a privileged lot, let us let this, uh, you know, let, let the things which we are reading and studying in the in, in these chapters motivate us and inspire us to hold on to his teaching more and more, so that we will know his truth at a deeper and deeper level, so that we can really be set free from everything which is holding us down and which is preventing us from enjoying the victorious life that we are meant to have. And when I say victorious life, I'm not saying that it will be a pain-free life. Jesus never ever said that our life will be you know, trial free. We, he said, you will have difficulties. But he says, take courage because I have overcome. You will always overcome. Trials will always be there. But every trial which comes along, you will be able to overcome and you will be able to rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. So it doesn't matter what happens. You will be able to maintain that attitude of rejoicing and joyfulness because the Lord is in control. You will have that assurance in your heart. You will be an overcomer. You will not go into depression. You will not feel defeated. So that is the assurance that we can have in our Christian walk. Okay, so moving on into chapter 9, which, which is the entire chapter is focused upon the story of one man, uh, which basically means that John considered this particular story important enough that he devoted an entire chapter to the story of this blind man. Um, maybe we can begin by looking at the first few verses. Um, maybe we can uh, read up to verse 8. So uh, John chapter 9, verses 1 to 8, if someone could read out. John chapter 9, 1 to 8. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the work, world, I am the light of the world. When he had said those 
these things he spread on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and he said to him go wash in the pool of siloam which is translated translated saint so he went and washed and came back saying therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said is not this he who said and begged yes so um let's look at the first few verses um so they uh, the disciples and jesus they see a man who has been blind from birth and the question which the disciples ask is why is this man blind right from birth it's a very sad way to be born you know a new newborn baby uh, comes out of the womb and it has no eyes very sad so they ask why why this terrible terrible uh, you know uh, thing which has happened to this person is it because god knew that this man is going to be living a very horrible sinful life so even you know from the time of birth itself god punished him so in that sense did this man sin god knew that he is going to be living a very very sinful life and so in anticipation of the life which he is going to be living god gave him the punishment in the at, at the time of birth itself so is that the reason or is it because of, of some terrible sin which the parents have done why is the reason that this man was born blind all the uh, right from birth itself so then jesus replies and says neither this man nor his parents sinned but this happened so that the works of god might be displayed in him so uh, the learning that we get from this the principle which we can draw from this is that sometimes god allows negative things so that he can display his victorious works he is not allowing those negative things because he wants us to have a miserable life he is not allowing those negative things because he doesn't care about what happens to us he is allowing those negative things because then he will be able to display his powerful victorious works in our lives to take a very simple example you know god allowed stephen to be martyred i mean god could have prevented it but god allowed it why did god allow it because as a result of stephen's martyrdom um god was able to display his works the 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 early church got scattered you know they could no longer stay comfortably in uh, uh, judea and jerusalem they had they were forced to go out to other regions and when as they went Uh, to different regions they continue to share about jesus and what jesus is doing in their life so wherever they went god was able to start displaying his works and because they got scattered due to the martyrdom philip is forced to go to uh, some place in samaria and over there he he starts preaching and over there he does miracles and it says over there in um um acts chapter 8 verse 8 so there was great joy in that city that city would not have experienced that great joy if stephen had not got martyred so sometimes god's mind which is much bigger and which is able to think in ways that we in our little minds cannot think he allows negative things so that he may display his victorious works okay so he never allows something negative with harm in mind he allows negative things only with good in mind okay so that that's a that's a comforting uh, you know assurance that we can have that he never has harm in his mind towards us um all right so jesus uh, you know heals this man by spitting on the ground uh, making mud with the spit with the saliva and then putting that on his eyes Uh, it all sounds highly unhygienic um and i've always wondered why jesus would do that um you know but uh, this is what i read in a commentary that using clay you know and putting that on his eyes 
is like a work of creation because when God first created Adam in that garden, um, he took the clay and he made the, the human out of that clay. You know, every single cell in that Adam's body was made out of that clay. You know, all the veins and the nerves and the muscles. I mean, this the human body is so intricate. It was all made out of that clay, created for the first time. So here, I mean, this is what, you know, this was the suggestion made by that particular commentator in his commentary. Um, so he, he suggested that maybe this person's eye, you know, the components of his eye had not formed. So God was lit literally had to create all the components, you know, which need which which are required to make a human eye. So God used the clay to literally create those components so that his eye became whole and then he was able to see. So it was an act of creation which God literally did in his eye to you know give him a functional eye. Um or eyes, you know, both his eyes, yeah. Uh, so that's just one uh, theory. So anyway, this is the response which you know, uh, which which we see from the people uh, once the healing takes place. The neighbors are very very excited. Uh, you know, um, so they say, uh, "Is this the man who was blind?" And then the man says, "Yes, it is definitely me." You know, so they are very excited about that. The Pharisees, on the other hand, respond in two ways. There are some who say that would be okay maybe we should actually read those verses yes so if someone could read out um uh, verse 13 onwards maybe up to verse 17 13 to 17 they brought him who firmly was blind to the pharisees now it was a sabbath when jesus met the clay and opened his eyes then the pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight he said to them how he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. All right. Uh, so there are four different responses here. The neighbors are curious uh, uh, and they're excited to see this man healed. Pharisees, there are two responses. Uh, there are some who actually start thinking that maybe this is really you know, the Messiah because they say, how can a sinner perform such signs? So which means maybe he really is who he claims to be. Maybe he re really is from above. Um, but then you have the other legalistic Pharisees. They say this man is not from God because he did not keep the Sabbath. So they're only focused on the legalism. They don't care that the man has been healed. As for the blind man himself, he, he decides this man must be a great prophet because he has done a great miracle like the Old Testament prophets. You know, So uh, that is what he believes. Um, then they call in the parents. Um, the Pharisees, they're not willing to believe that he's act he was actually blind all the time from birth and such a great miracle has taken place. They're not willing to believe that. So let's look at this, um, this dialogue which takes place between the Pharisees and the parents. Um, that would be verses 18 to 23. Yeah, someone could read out 18 to 23. Okay. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received in sight, sight, until they called the parents of him, who was the same with sight. And they answered them, saying, is, your, is, is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had 
agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was right, he would be put out of the synagogue. They moved his parents said, He is of age, ask him. Dawn devotes an entire chapter to this one story. He very clearly outlines the re responses and reactions of the different characters you know, involved in this story. And here he's focusing on the parents and their response. Now, here is a person who was born uh, blind. From birth itself, he could not see, most probably because the, uh, you know, the, the very intricate organs which together composed the eye had not even formed fully in the baby. So when the baby was born, all the things which are required to make an actual human eye were not even there. And now, miraculously, all of those components have come into existence and this person is able to see clearly. So an, something amazing has happened. This is a very, very clear proof that an act of creation, something divine, has occurred over here among this, you know, among these people. And the parents have witnessed it. They are seeing someone whom they have known as a blind person from babyhood. They are now seeing him with both his eyes, you know, perfectly normal, perfectly seeing. And what is the choice that they make? They are afraid to admit that this is someone, you know, divine, that he, that maybe that this is someone very great. Rather, they, you know, when they are approached and they are questioned, this was their chance to openly confess and say, yes, we believe in this person who has healed our son. No, rather, you know, they say, you ask him, you know, you deal with this between you and him. Don't get us involved. And it's explained why they do that. It says in verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledges that Jesus was Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. They did not want to be excommunicated. For them, it was more important to continue being members of the synagogue than being members of the heavenly kingdom. I mean, imagine this is something that has been done for their own son. And this is the response. So the very first readers of the Gospel of John, when they are reading the story, think of all the thoughts which would, have, which would have come to their mind. Because these new believers who are reading this Gospel, they are going through so much struggle. Uh, the, the Jewish synagogues have completely excommunicated them. Nobody, none of their neighbors and relatives you know, invites them for any wedding, any funeral, nothing. So they would have read this chapter with great interest to see the different responses of the people towards Jesus. And then after reading this story, they would have to decide for themselves, what will my response be? I'm going through the same kind of fears and struggles that these people were facing in the story. This is the way they chose to respond. But maybe my response can be different. So that is why. John takes the effort to put down all of these details. Very sadly, the parents, instead of being joyous and grateful and you know, openly coming and admitting their allegiance and loyalty to Jesus, they back away. They don't want any part of it. It's a very, very sad response. On the other hand, when you come to the blind man himself, he, he is so excited about what has been done for him. and. Um, we see his response in his dialogue with the Pharisees. Uh, so if someone could read out for us, uh, verses 24 to 34. 24 to 34. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not i do not know one thing i know that though i was blind now i see then they said to him again what did he do to you how did he open your eyes he answered them i told you already and you did not listen why do you want to hear it again do you also want to become his disciples then they re revealed him and said you are his disciples Disciple, what we are Moses, 
disciples we know that god has spoke to moses as for this fellow we do not know where he is from the man answered and said to them why this is a marvels thing that you do not know where is he from and yet he has opened my eyes now we know that god does not hear sinners but if anyone is a worshipper of god and does his will he hears him since the world begin it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind if this man were not from god he could do nothing they answered and said to him you were completely born in sins and are you teaching us and they cast him out yeah if you look at the previous chapter chapter 8 an entire chapter was devoted to jesus telling them i am from above i am from the father he has sent me i am speaking his words all that jesus said to them and now what are these people saying over here the pharisees they're saying this man we know he's a sinner and they say in verse uh, um, uh, 29 we know that god spoke to moses but as for this fellow we don't even know where he comes from the whole of previous chapter jesus explained to them exactly from where he came and then this blind man he says you know who is now healed he says now that is remarkable you don't know where he comes from yet he opened my eyes i mean the the fact that he opened my eyes should give you an indication of where he has come from definitely has come from above so what they did not catch in an entire chapter this man is now catching you know in 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 a, in in a, in a matter of minutes and he's saying my eyes have been healed can a sinner do this you know that's what he says in one of the earlier verses um he says um i can't get the exact verse but he says ah okay only a person who is from god will be able to do this. that would be in uh, verses um uh, 31 32 33 so he says Uh, we know that god does not listen to sinners he listens to the godly person who does his will so he says in verse 33 if this man were not from god he could do nothing explaining in the previous chapter this man is now explaining to the pharisees and the pharisees are really angry and they say you sinful man you i'm sure you're blind because you sinned and now you're trying to lecture us is it so this man has caught in a few minutes the truths which jesus was trying to convey in an entire cha- previous chapter and uh, uh, so this man says eagerly to them do you also want to become his disciples so he could not care less whether he's going to be thrown out of the synagogue or what he is determined to be openly and a follower of jesus therefore in verse 35 you know jesus comes to him and finds him later and he says to him do you believe in the son of man you know this man probably didn't really know who on earth is son of man because son of man is talked about in daniel chapter 7 where it describes about how son of man is the one that the ancient of days will send to the earth one day to judge the earth so uh, jesus, jesus must, must have explained those details to him about who the son of man is and all of that and this is the what the man does he says then the man said lord i believe and he worshiped him so yes he definitely must have been thrown out of the synagogue but now he is a follower of jesus and unlike all these people you know who jesus again and again said you will die in your sins this man is not going to die in his sins he is going to be eternally with jesus so this is a very this is a reason why uh john places this story after that entire dialogue which took place in the previous chapter so those people to with to whom jesus so patiently again and again repeated and taught they failed to catch it but this man he catches it and he openly worships jesus and acknowledges him as the lord okay which is why jesus says in the concluding sentences you know this blind man he saw the truth but you people who can see you refuse to see the truth is what jesus says in the end all right so let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for all the truths that we could reflect upon today uh, in our uh, class uh, we pray oh lord that you would remind us of these 
important principles again and again. Help us, O oh Lord, not to be so hard-hearted and um, uh, deaf towards the things which you are trying to reveal to us. Lord, enable us to be like the blind man who, once he was given some proof about Jesus' divinity, he was willing to go all the way and completely believe and completely worship. So, O oh Lord, all of us have experienced some proof or the other of how you are the true and living God. So, Lord, based on that, enable us now to hold on to you and grow in you and know you at a deeper and deeper level to an extent where we will know the truth so deeply that it can actually start setting us free from everything which is holding us down. So we pray that, Lord, we, you would make that happen for every one of us and enable us to see much victory in our lives, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.